that is streamed on Facebook. Uh, the recording uh, will be posted on International Ideas uh, YouTube channels uh, uh, later, uh, where you will also find the previous uh, lectures as well. And one of what, which uh, is very relevant to the discussion we'll be having today with uh, Professor uh, Jujan Tam. So at this point, um, uh, very warm welcome to all of you. I see uh, quite a few of you in the participant list. So um, thank you for joining us on WebEx and Facebook. And uh, sorry about the late start. Uh, and uh, my name is uh, Inke. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be joining you from Mongolia today and moderate this uh, session, which would be an interesting session and how also timely um, this session is given all the, you know, recent elections we have witnessed, including the one in the US still going on, it seems like. Um, so today's lecture is uh, a part of a series of online lect lectures that International IDEA is organizing in collaboration uh, with friends in different countries in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so we have friends collaborating from Thailand, the Philippines, uh, Nepal, Myanmar, Fiji, Indonesia, Vietnam, and of course, Open Society Forum is very proud to be uh, work uh, with the idea uh, as well. So the lectures are organized uh, on a fortnightly basis. The next one is coming up in two week, uh, weeks, so keep an eye out for more information on that, on IDEA and uh, IDEA's Facebook uh, and Twitter pages. So before we start, there is also a few housekeeping announcements I would like to make. One is uh, the pre-lecture uh, survey. I already asked you to uh, fill that out. Uh, and throughout the lecture, we will also be posting like snap, very quick questions. Uh, it will be like a one minute, very quick question. So if you can also fill that uh, out, that would be very helpful. It will make this event more interactive and uh, exciting for all of us. So please do that, but this only also applies to those uh, joining us on uh, WebEx. And then at the end of the um, uh, lecture, uh, after Professor Ta has spoken, we will have a Q&A session and uh, uh, we'll appreciate if you can actually write your questions in the chat box on the right hand uh, also side um, of the screen and address, make sure you address that, that, uh, that to everyone so we can all see uh, what kind of questions are coming in. So I think I've covered all the housekeeping uh, stuff. And uh, let me now introduce uh, Professor uh, Jujun Tam. So um, Jujun Tam is, of course, you know, you um, hosted uh, one of the previous lectures and uh, it was a very exciting um, uh, discussion as well. And today's discussion is also very much re uh, relevant to that discussion, like a continuation of that discussion. So I'm very happy uh, to welcome you. Uh, uh, so Jujin Tam is professor at Melbourne uh, Law School. He's also director of the Electoral Regulation uh, Research Network, which is an initiative sponsored uh, by Australia's New South Wales Election Commission, uh, Victorian Electoral Commission, uh, and uh, Melbourne uh, Law School. Um, Actually, um, I was actually quite excited to learn uh, about this uh, network uh, because the, as someone who has been uh, working with civil society groups, government and policy makers uh, uh, to improve electoral uh, integrity and build trust in democratic processes more for, for more than a decade, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, such a robust platform uh, exists for applied research uh, uh, in this field. And the Professor Tam has been at the forefront of this initiative uh, since its very uh, beginning in two, 2012. Um, so as a leading ex expert in the field, he has researched and uh, written extensively on topics uh, relevant to electoral uh, democracy, political participation, and uh, in particular, uh, the controversial role of money in politics, exploring questions uh, relevant to many countries, uh, including Australia, uh, where he's currently based, such, uh, such as should the uh, foreign uh, political donations be banned, uh, public funding of political parties, and of course today's topic, uh, which is looking at issues at the intersection of uh, digital campaigning and uh, political finance. 
So now let me pass it on uh, to Professor The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, NK, for that generous introduction. And uh, really, let me begin by thank you, um, International Idea, for this great initiative. I think uh, particularly the efforts of Adi and Jennifer. Um, uh, I've learned a lot through this online uh, lecture series, and uh, I very much look forward to learning more, including in this particular event. Um, what I plan to do today is really deal in the intersection with three sets of challenges um, that constitute existential threats to democracies across the world. The first is money in politics, uh, which not doesn't just pose a threat in terms of the integrity of elections, but also according to the OECD policy capture. And according to the UN uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, in fact, in the worst case scenarios, state capture by moneyed interests. Now, the second uh, set of uh, challenges, which constitute also an existential threat, is really the impact of digital technologies. Uh, which I think we all can uh, agree is, is affecting a profound transformation in terms of the landscape governing democracies. So the principal question that I'm going to address today is how might digital campaigning affect the problems of political finance? And I'm going to do so by reference to a third set of challenges and really the challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic and really reflecting upon how the impact of digital technologies on the problems of political finance might be shaped uh, by COVID-19. And what I'm presenting today and the paper that will be circulated after today's event is really conducted by way of a road mapping exercise. So what I mean by that is really, I'm trying to sort of elucidate uh, what I consider to be some of the key issues or what might be a good framework in thinking through these issues. And there'll be various examples in the presentation and also in the paper to, uh, to illustrate the arguments. But really, it's really by way of preliminary analysis, um, it's really by way of a conversational starter. And I'm really looking forward to the interactions I have today on this event and also after this event in terms of your experiences, your perspectives in terms of your particular country. Now, let me begin by some definitions and I'm going to uh, be brave and uh, share my screen. Okay. Great. Did that work, MK? Sorry, I'm, it seemed to work okay. on my side. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to run through the definitions reasonably quickly, but to sort of to set the scene for the analysis, the analysis that follows. So the first is really to sort of be clear in terms of what I mean by digital campaigning. And what I mean is really the use of digital media in election campaigns. And as we all know, that occurs through a swirl of strategies, uh, internet strategies, social media strategies, data-driven strategies, and also the use of political campaign software. And when we think about digital campaigning, we must of course think about it in the context of the fact that election campaigning of course is long-standing. And election campaigning takes various forms. We know, of course, it takes the form of face-to-face -face campaigning, doorknock campaignings, gatherings, rallies. It also takes uh, uses what's called traditional or legacy medium, like television, radio, and print. And for purpose of today's event, it takes the form of digital campaigning. Now, why the focus of digital campaigning? And I suppose we can distinguish digital campaigning or the digital medium from those other forms of campaigning through a combination of various features. One is accessibility, both in terms of coverage of internet or mobile services, uh, in terms of low cost of digital devices, but also the fact that uh, cross-border cross communication can occur if, with tremendous ease. Speed, and in fact, I was reminded about this when I was reading today about how um, disinformation, or let's put it more plainly, lies that uh, uh, Joe Biden had lost Pennsylvania uh, that were actually put in terms of a YouTube video. And in 12 hours, uh, according to a piece in New York Times, it had been viewed 900,000 times. So that goes to the speed in terms of the communication and the distribution and production of content. Interactivity. So people talk about not just a move away from passive audience to pro users. That is to say that people are not just using content, but they're also producing content and able to do so in a very accessible and uh, cost effective ways. Targeting, and this really connects to the use of data, both in terms of collection harvesting, 
algorithms, analytics, and also personality profiles. And the last feature I'll point out is called anonymity. So that uh, in terms of digital campaigning, uh, what can uh, can uh, information can actually be promulgated without the entity being truly known, including by messages sent by um, com computer programs or automations, for example, like the so-called bots. Now, what is clear is, of course, that digital campaigning can have an upside in terms of the integrity and the, the robustness of democracies, both in terms of broadening and deepening political participation, communication, deliberation, and accountability. In elections, digital campaigning can, in fact, be a source of richer and deeper voter information. It can provide for more effective campaigning uh, by political parties or other political organizations. Now, at the same time, what we of course know is that there are clear threats in terms of digital campaigning. Now, I'm going, I can't seem to, there we go. And these are threats are various related threats, which I don't propose to deal with uh, directly in this presentation, given my focus on the problems of political finance, but simply to point out, of course, they have relevance in terms of this particular area. So we have the threat of disinformation or what is colloquially referred to as fake news. We have problems in terms of interference by foreign nations in elections. We have this more subtle but really profound problem of the public sphere being undermined through the digital medium, through the forms of communications uh, that it favors, both in terms of virality, meaning the certain premium in terms of emotional appeals, but also in terms of messages that might seek to um, maintain or exacerbate uh, polarizing uh, uh, aspects in terms of the constituency. And we again have even a much more subtle problem, but very much pressing and potent, is, is the problem that Josh Soros actually alerted to about the erosion or undermining of political freedom or political economy through the choice architecture that's established by information technology companies. Now, connected in all that is, of course, the really the substantial market power, at times quasi-monopolistic power of the big tech companies. Now, all these are really, um, uh, is beyond uh, the scope of my presentation or paper to deal with any sustained way. What I propose to do is, of course, focus on the problems of political finance. And by political finance, I'm gonna adopt the very helpful definition that's set out by the International Idea Handbook on Political Finance as, to quote, the, the financing illegal and illegal financing of ongoing political party activities and electoral campaigns. In particular, campaigns by candidates and political parties, but also by third parties. Now, when we think of political finance or specifically problems by political finance, they of course manifest themselves in various ways. And they are quite strongly shaped by the political economies of different nation states. Now, given the audience for this lecture, I'm going to focus on the Asia Pacific. Now, that cuts the come down to complexity of the task somewhat, but not, but not by much. Because we, of course, know that the Asia Pacific region is the most populous region in the, in the world. It's very heterogeneous, including in terms of the different regimes it has, authoritarian, hybrid, and democratic regimes democratic regimes uh, performing at varying levels. But for the sake of analytical simplicity, let me sort of present in a sort of a stylized way, yeah? What are problems of political finance in the Asia Pacific region? And what you have in that slide um, is me sort of drawing heavily on two important international idea publications uh, identifying what are the sort of uh, key challenges in terms of political finance in the Asia Pacific region. What I'm going to do for further analytical simplicity is really cluster these problems under two headings. The heading of corruption, and here I include problems in terms of abuse of state resources, clientelism, intersection between business and politics, illicit funding, and vote buying. 
in my mind, these are really just different ways in which the problem corruption manifests itself. And then the second heading is about unequal electoral contests. And here I'll include in this particular grouping, the lack of resources for opposition parties and female candidates and regulations discouraging competition. Now with this unequal lens of corruption and inequality in electoral contests, let me now turn to the question, two questions, yeah? flip side of each other. How might digital campaigning address the problems of political finance? And how, conversely, might it worsen the problems of political finance? Now, what we can see in terms of the upside or the possible upside of digital campaigning in terms of addressing the problems of political finance is that it can provide a very effective tool in terms of dealing with these problems, in both in terms of corruption, and secondly, I'll come to in terms of equality in electoral contests. Now, it can provide a tool if, in fact, there were digital systems of reporting and disclosure set up um, by public agency, for example, electoral management bodies, which enable uh, the public and civil society organizations greater ease in following the money. Yeah. And in fact, if you combine that kind of data in terms of political funding together with effective search tools with information concerning lobbying, assets and money laundering, and this in fact was what was recommended by the um, uh, 2017 International Idea Global State of Democracy report, uh, these tools can be quite potent weapons against policy and state capture by moneyed interests, including their use of illicit funding. Another way in which um, a digital campaigning can be used as a tool is, of course, in anti-corruption campaigns. Yeah. So we saw this, for example, in Malaysia with the, the, uh, the campaign against former Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak for his diversion of funds from 1MDB. Uh, we see this in terms of anti-corruption campaigns in Indonesia, including campaigns by KPK. Yeah. And digital campaigning, too, can be particularly attractive to oppositional movements. Yeah. Opposition movements that are seeking to actually avoid the much more stringent regulation that might apply to tra traditional or legacy media. An example of this is really the, the Arabs, one of the prime examples is really the Arab Supreme uprisings, where digital tools were used uh, to great effect to, to communicate with the external, uh, with the outside world. Now, in the COVID 19 pandemic, it is possible, it is possible that there might be an increased reliance in some countries or in many countries on digital campaigning given social distancing rules. Now, having said that, I think the extent to which there's such an increase or the extent to which digital campaigning uh, displaces other forms of campaigning, I think is unclear or somewhat moot. Uh, one can, for example, uh, just as examples, the rallies that were held by presidential candidate Trump in the recent US presidential election. Or another example uh, closer to where we are, campaigning in the upcoming December regional elections, where there seems to be a continuation in terms of face-to-face -face campaigning. Now that said, if in fact, digital campaigning uh, acts as a replacement for face-to-face -face campaigning, it is possible that it might actually disrupt some uh, the dynamics of vote buying uh, as a result. And it's something uh, to, to, to monitor. Now, digital campaigning can also be, uh, can provide for a more level playing field. So what's been said, for example, in Malaysia, particularly in the, uh, the last uh, general elections, the 14 general elections, that uh, digital uh, campaigning was used as a weapon of the week for the opposition parties, was in fact instrumental in ending the long rule by the ruling coalition, Barisan National. And in fact, there's consistent evidence in both in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand that smaller parties can account for the equivalent internet presence to bigger, richer parties with a lesser spend. Yeah. So this really connects to the feature of accessibility of digital campaigning. And digital campaigning, in a related note, can broaden political participation. So we've seen across the world the so-called bond digital organizations. So an example from Australia is GetUp. Uh, it's a what's it's a third-party organization 
that really uh, engages with his members. His members are really digital members, yeah, okay? And really, and it's actually as a result of pioneering these forms of a digital political participation has actually been responsible for, you know, increased activism in various forms. Now, the last dot point on that particular column is that digital campaigning can level the playing field in terms of fundraising. And that is through crowdfunding. And again, the, the famous example here is Barack Obama, uh, President Barack Obama's presidential campaign. But we can add to that, for example, Bernie Sanders' campaign and Elizabeth Warren's campaign to be Democrat, the Democratic Party's presidential nominee. Now, let me come to the flip side of the question. How might digital campaigning worsen problems of political finance? And there's really a dark mirror here for the potential of digital campaigning to address the problems of political finance. Digital campaigning doesn't necessarily lead to transparency or sunlight necessary as an antidote to corruption. On the contrary, it relies in key respects on secrecy. Now, this is obvious in terms of anonymity, but it's also the case with digital micro-targeting, with each carried out to the granular level of targeting specific individuals constitutes dark advertising. That is advertising that's only known between the creator and distributors of the advertising on one hand and the individual recipient on the other. And furthermore, in terms of the opaque forces shaping digital campaigning, is the often impenetrable use of big data. And we saw this vividly illustrated by Cambridge Analytica's activities in the United Kingdom's Brexit referendum. And neither is digital campaigning the sole or dominant preserve of oppositional movements. Indeed, it can be used effectively by dominant political parties and those seeking to avoid accountability. In many authoritarian regimes, for instance, social media has been co-opted as a tool for information control. To suppress fundamental human rights, to discredit political opposition, and to drown out political dissent. In Indonesia, for example, anti-corruption anti campaigners who have been subject to digital attacks, including the use of bots and trolls, which appear to have been orchestrated by elements within the Indonesian government. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has, in fact, worsened the situation by providing a convenient excuse for some governments for suppressing digital speech, with some governments targeting online dissent on the pretext on combating fake news concerning the virus. In this disturbing way, the pandemic operates according to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Freedom of Expression and Speech as to, quote, a pathogen of repression. Now, the broader point to be made is that digital campaigning is not intrinsically a weapon of the weak. It is also a weapon of the strong. And more pertinently for this paper, digital campaigning is easily deployed by those with a greater amount of funding. And this arises most fundamentally from the fact that digital campaigning is not only organic, that is in terms of free content, but also paid. And paid digital campaigning can enhance the scope and effectiveness of campaigning in various ways. And you see in terms of the third dot point in the right column, the various ways in which paid campaigning, paid digital campaigning can en enhance its effectiveness. Data-driven strategies, Cambridge Analytica again being the, uh, 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 the vivid example. Uh, paid advertising, of course. Cyber troops. And what do I mean by cyber troops? Uh, and I'm using a definition here from the Oxford Project on Computational Propaganda. Uh, what I mean to refer to are government, military, or political party teams committed, committed to manipulating public opinion over social media. And what that project has found is that the number of countries in which cyber troops are present have increased dramatically in the past few years, from 28 countries in 2017 to 48 countries in 2018, and now 70, and 70 countries in 2019. And the use of cyber troops is clear in terms of the Asia Pacific region. 
We saw this clearly in terms of the 2019 Indonesian presidential elections and also in terms of the last uh, Malaysian general elections. And in terms of the strategies here, and in terms of this campaigning, the distinction I put between organic and paid can often be blurred. Often, paid digital campaigning is directed at eliciting organic campaigning. And sometimes it can do so by masquerading as organic campaigning. Now, take for instance the paid use, the paid use of social media influencers, such as buzzers in Indonesia. Their effective use will largely depend on others perceiving that the opinions of the influencers are generally held and not the result of financial inducement. Another way in which the paid form of digital campaigning occurs, which is important to foreground, is the digital campaigning industry. And in important respects, this industry is transnational. So one example is really one of the companies uh, at the heart of the Cambridge Analytica controversy, SCL elections. Now, according to the UK parliamentary report on, on fake news and disinfo disinformation and fake news, SCL elections and campaign elections for prime ministers and presidents since 1994 in at least 28 countries. Now, a more recent example uh, is the 2020 New Zealand elections, where the so-called bad boys of Brexit Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore, the two chief architects of the Leave EU campaign in UK, provided paid support to Winston Peters and his party, New Zealand First. Now, through all these paid forms, digital campaigning can heighten the risk of corruption by inflating the cost of election campaigns. So the cost of election campaigns increases, so the need for political parties and candidates to raise funds, and given the pre-existing clientelistic uh, relationships and relationships uh, between parties and business, the main source of funds will be corporate funds. And equally clear, digital campaigning, because of the money it involves, can distort election campaigns by providing added advantage to the greater resource. Let me end by pointing out another problem that's also important to bear in mind in terms of digital campaign, campaigning. It gives rise to new ways of abusing state resources. And the use of government data by incumbent parties is a case in point. So in Malaysia, for instance, again, in from the last general election, there's evidence that Barisan National Parties access and use personal data uh, collected by government agencies for their election campaigns. And the pandemic may in fact exacerbate this particular risk by increasing the legitimacy of government gathering and using personal data of the citizens to contain the spread of virus, notably through health surveillance, uh, such as contact tracing, but also through the diminution of accountability measures uh, as governments operate in so-called emergency mode. Let me come to the, my concluding section. How the, the balance between these opposing tendencies and how they play out will depend on particular national context with a complex range of factors present. Technological changes will interact with political and social dynamics as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's therefore wise to avoid technological determinism, either of the utopian kind, that digital campaigning will address the problems of political finance, or the dystopian genre, where the view is that digital campaigning will worsen the problems of political finance. Now, a crucial element that will shift the impact of digital campaigning on the problems of political finance will be regulation. Effective regulation, both in design and implementation, can steer digital campaigning in the direction of enhancing the integrity of political finance. And what you have on this slide are uh, some quite very well, some new documents who are not necessarily not exclusively dedicated to political finance, but which are quite useful in terms of providing guidance for the way forward. And what I'd like to do in the next minute or so is really highlight six regulatory principles 
one can draw from these sources in terms of regulating digital campaigning in the space of political finance. One is media neutrality. So if there should be regulation, it should extend to digital campaigning and generally should not be restricted to particular media. Transparency. And here, I think we can take heed of the advocacy by the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right of freedom of opinion and expression for an agenda of radical transparency in the digital age. And we should be considering measures such as digital imprints of advertising, a register of political advertising, including digital, uh, digital ad uh, advertising, and details of spending on digital campaigning. Limits on spending. And here I think uh, we can take heart from the recommendation from the New Delhi Declaration on Political Finance Regulation in South Asia to limit election campaign spending to reasonable limits. At this point, too, it seems to me it's important to give consideration to full implications of data as currency in this area of political finance and also to measures to quote, to restore the human scale. That is to say, restore campaigning to human interaction. And we might consider in that particular space about limiting the use of personal data for campaigning purposes. The fourth principle we have up this slide are controls on the use of government digital resources for election campaigning. So this should extend to government advertising in the pre-election period, uh, which, where there should be controls that are particularly strict. Effective oversight, this of course is an abiding concern of those of reformers in this area. And it seems to me that in this, in this space of digital campaigning, as with political finance regulation generally, there should be an oversight of ecosystem comprising of independent and professional electoral commissions, anti-corruption agencies, interagency collaboration, courts, as well as political parties and civil society organizations. The last principle, regular and frequent information sharing and review is particularly vital. We're in the midst of an acceleration moment in technology, which will have a profound impact on the workings of democracies. As former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan put it, technology does not stand still. Neither can democracy. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, so just to remind our uh, participants, uh, if you have questions uh, on this uh, topic to Professor uh, Jujan Tham, uh, you can go to the chat box on the right side of the screen and address that to um, all panelists so we can see your questions and I can read it out to everybody. Um, uh, and then we can uh, have a discussion um, around this topic. Also, we have, uh, like among our participants, we have a few experts joining us from uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, Philippines and Malaysia. And since this is such uh, a prominent kind of challenge now that uh, is affecting elections all around the region, actually globally, um, I thought we thought it would be interesting to also hear from some of the participants um, uh, to add to what uh, Professor um, Tham has uh, presented to us and see how this uh, uh, you know challenge of the, the uh, digital campaigning is affecting the challenge we already were uh, uh, you know struggling with our in our region in terms of uh, the role that many plays uh, in our uh, elections and uh, politics. So. Um, Ninis, if you can uh, hear me. Um, Ninis, are you here with us? Um, um, okay. If Ninis is here, um, if it, Ninis is the map here, then um, uh, we have also uh, friends from Australia and Malaysia. So, uh, uh, joining us today to offer um, insights into how um, 
digital campaigning is also unfolding in uh, their recent elections and how it's also contributing to the problems we have in terms of uh, political corruption, you, uh, Professor Chan, uh, Tham described. So there's a question for Amblina. Um, I'll read it out to everybody. Um, should the digital companies such as Facebook be required to disclose the uh, amount of money received from political parties for election campaigning? Facebook did this uh, in the recent Myanmar elections. Not sure if they were obliged to do so or did so voluntarily. Professor Tan, would you? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, and if you want um, uh, the, the UK Electoral Commission report that you have in a slide, as well as the UK um, House of Commons report, essentially makes that recommendation. And I think uh, this is where I think um, it comes head to head with um, the other problem with digital campaigning I mentioned, which I said I wasn't going to cover in any uh, sustained detail the power of the big tech companies. Yeah. Uh, while there's basically being a strong push by electoral commission and the House of Commons, the government is basically, the UK government is basically dragging its feet. And I think this is a big issue in this area in terms of how do you get reform to regulate the digital companies? And, um, and I think it's what the UK inquiry showed is are two things. One is, and this is the word they use, the contempt showed by Facebook in terms of inquiry. And when it said talk about the contempt, it spoke basically about the repeated uh, request for Mark Zuckerberg to come before the committee and he refused to, all right? And which really underlines the need for actually international cooperation to actually deal with uh, some uh, problem like this. Um, actually, if I can just like add uh, a little bit of perspective also from Mongolia. Uh, Facebook has this uh, new uh, feature ad library, uh, which they actually launched in Mongolia in our June, last June election. But uh, it wasn't really an effective thing to do um, mm. because, uh, you know, for that ad library to uh, actually work and uh, uh, contribute to transparency around money in politics, uh, those, the candidates and political parties actually have to go through an authorization process and then uh, kind of uh, label their uh, advertisements as political. But that didn't happen because there, right. there was no requirement in our local laws uh, requiring uh, this kind of uh, transparency on the part of candidates and political parties, also third parties uh, doing campaigning uh, during the official election campaign period, as well as, uh, you know, before yeah. and after. Yeah. So um, this actually um, brings to like an interesting point because you know mm -hmm. elections are national state things, right? It's, it's, it's these are like important political events happening within national mm -hmm. states. But when it comes to Facebook and Twitter, these are like transnational companies. And even though they are trying to do something in response to the challenges we just described in this lecture, if yeah. the national uh, laws are not uh, on par with these new yeah. policies. Uh, you know, Mongolia's case kind of shows that it's actually quite, uh, uh, quite useless. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I agree with you, Jay. You, you need authorization laws, right? I mean, you need to have a regulatory mm -hmm. framework. I think it, it cannot rely on voluntary measures on the part of the big tech companies. It's not going to work that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at this point, there is a polling question posted uh, by Adi on the, on the right side. Um, uh, we have. Uh, one minute to answer. Actually, 30 seconds to answer this question. I would be very happy if you could do that for us. I'll read out the question uh, to those of you who are uh, joining on Facebook. Uh, digital campaigning has worsened the problems of uh, political corruption in my country. An interesting, very relevant question. Let's see how many of you uh, have answered the agree, disagree, unsure. So those are the options you have. So again, if you have questions, uh, please uh, 
uh, write your questions in, in the chat box, uh, those of you who are um, on WebEx. And please make sure that you address that to all panelists. Interesting, but uh, I have another question since uh, as we uh, wait for the following results. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Twitter actually stopped all paid uh, advertisement, advertisements in, I think, I believe November last last year, right? Yeah. But then you said in your lecture, uh, it's actually there is uh, the boundaries between paid political advertising and, uh, you know, organic uh, unpaid content is also very blurry. So yeah. how effective do you think that, uh, you know, uh, this kind of major uh, uh, would be in kind of controlling uh, the problems yeah. we are uh, seeing? Yeah, I, I don't support, I mean, I support greater transparency in terms of product advertising, but I don't support a ban on um, uh, advertising, including on the digital form. I mean, why shouldn't, you know, I mean, so long as we can ensure proper transparency, we can deal with issues in terms of corruption and equality, you know, it seems to me digital campaigning can, in fact, um, you know, be a boon in terms of democracy. Um, can I perhaps answer a different aspect to this? Because um, some of this regulation, again, comes back to the power of the tech companies, can actually experience quite strong pushback um, from the tech companies. So the register of political advertising, so I said something, I said something similar to what you talked about in Mongolia, uh, Enki. Um, there was a requirement put in place in Canada and all except for Facebook, they, some of the companies basically said, look, we can't do this. So we're gonna, not gonna take any paid political advertising. And that seems to be a retrograde, re, retrograde step, if you like. Um, but I do think that's not an insurmountable problem, I think, because Facebook is able to do it and I think once you have a big one or a big competitors do it, the rest will actually feel that there's actually a fair bit of money involved too in terms of for the companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from. Uh, oh, so before we do that, um, on the polling question we just asked, uh, uh, two out of twelve uh, agree. Um, we have one disagreeing out of twelve, and uh, three unsure. Yeah. So most, yeah, most of us agree or um, unsure about the uh, the corrupt, how it contributes to corruption. And then we have a question from Michael. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more on cyber troops? Uh, would the government social media units fall under this category? Thanks. Um, so let me just repeat the definition of cyber troops I'm using, and it's not my original definition. It's from that. Uh, the OXA project, and I'll put a link into the chat shortly. They define it as government, military, or political party teams committed to manipulating public opinion over social media. So the answer to your question is yes, right? It includes government. And I suppose in this too, we're not just looking at about private actors. Uh, we're also looking at um, uh, mm -hmm. government actors in terms of the digital campaigning space. Now, let me... I'll put a link here where you can see the cyber troops report. So this is actually adds an interesting um, dynamic to the pro problems of uh, you know abuse of uh, state resources in elections, which is already a huge problem, in the, especially in the in Asia and the Pacific uh, uh, region. So, uh, like from a practitioner point of view, though. Uh, what would be more like effective effective ways to, especially in terms of like controlling this kind of issue in world and government? Yeah, um, is there uh, a good practice emerging somewhere in the region? Are we aware of that? Yeah, I think you know at the very least you want to have very uh, strong caretaker regulation, so that is when when um, elections are called, uh, essentially that uh, that. The party that you know is still in power but is uh, contesting for the next election basically there's very strict regulation in terms of what they can use in terms of government resources generally right so mm -hmm. and that will include data it will include personnel and so on and so forth um i think the other area to look in, into very closely is that um in in many countries there'll be some kind of funding for parliamentarians uh less latest yeah less latest to perform their jobs yeah, which is uh, uh, are based on good reasons because you know legislators need uh, um, funds to do that. But again, I think you need strict regulation in terms of uh, once elections are called, 
okay, that those funds cannot be used for electioneering purposes. So this is a problem in Australia, yeah. right? So uh, as well as other countries, um, I think th those are the things you'll be uh, be looking at. Um, and I do think that the data data is a uh, easy one to deal with. I mean, they just shouldn't be able to access the data. Political parties mm -hmm. should be able to access the data that's collected by government, and that would be in accordance with privacy regulation too. One of the key principles of privacy regulation is that you can only use the data for the purpose for which it was collected. So government collects data for public purposes, not for the purpose of, you know, political parties using it for election campaigns. Um, we have uh, Ninis with us, I think. Um, so uh, Ninis, if you can, uh, if you can unmute uh, her mic. Uh, Ninis, would you like to speak about that? Uh, Hi, you. can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear, can hear you? you? Okay. Thank you, Inky and Professor Yu uh, Xiong Sam. I'm sorry if I mis uh, misspell your name. I'm Linus from Indonesia. Uh, I'm just uh, yeah gonna give some uh, brief thought about uh, what happened in Indonesia. Uh, we are going to have local election in December 9, 2020, and in the context of uh, election amid uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, actually, the government and also the uh, election management bodies also uh, uh, also courage the contestant to do uh, uh, to use the uh, online media or uh, virtual campaigning. But it seems that the contestant still feels uh, it is more effective if they do uh, yeah uh, they do the conventional uh, campaigning, so they are not uh, used. Uh, the media uh, maximally, but I think uh, a campaign, social media campaign, it is uh, cheaper and it, I think it is easier. But uh, we in Indonesia, we don't have an effective uh, regulation uh, to tackle uh, the challenge that uh, Professor Yu Xiong Sam said before, because the regulation in Indonesia only limit the number of accounts that can be used by the uh, contestant. For example, in the provincial level, uh, they are only limited to have uh, 30 accounts of media social. And in the district level, they are only limited to have 20 social media accounts. So, and uh, I, I don't think it is uh, effective to tackle uh, that kind of challenge, for example, misinformation, hoax, uh, disinformation, uh, and so on, because uh, we have a problem uh, because in social media uh, campaign, I think the public can have uh, direct access to the uh, contestant. But when uh, the the election management body only uh, limited the number of the social media account, and uh, they only have uh, time to have campaign. Eight, uh, campaign campaign at only 14 days before the silent uh, before the election day um, it is still not uh, not um, not uh, solve the, the the challenge because we I think the the effective way is to to push the transparency like you said there is micro targeting in social media uh, we should know uh, how the so the social media platform works uh, uh, how this con how this uh, how some con uh, content of media social uh, I can get how the social media content can be distributed to, to the uh, special group or or so on and also the transparency um, we don't have the kind of regulation uh, that is the in the Indonesia context so actually I also have a question for uh, Professor Yu Shongtam. Uh, what is the the guideline or the essential to oversight social media campaign? Because I think the limit limitation the apa, uh, the if we only limit the number of social media uh, that's uh, registered by the contestant, it is not effective because there is a buzzer. You said uh, uh, army social media army that can spread the disinformation and misinformation uh, to the public. And uh, the uh, the social media the disinformation and misinformation can can be uh, one factor one factor that can uh, that can uh, what what we call it uh, 
that can uh, rise. Uh, I mean, if there is uh, disinformation, misinformation, or hoax that spread in media social, and then it can impact to be the demonstration in the field, for example, if the result of the election is not uh, is not uh, accepted by the public. I think that's my comment and question, Inky. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Um, there's actually another question from uh, Indonesia, and I think it's related. Is it possible to limit ads on social media? In Indonesia, candidates only can have ads on social media for 14 days. Yeah. I think the way I'll answer this is I think with the first principle I had is about media, media neutrality. What I mean by that is that regulations that don't select out a particular medium, whether it even be social media. Yeah. So for me, the primary concern in this area is about put, put aside the questions of disinformation, put aside the question of foreign interference. I just want to focus on political finance, right? Okay. The problem is about money. Yeah. And that money finds different ways to influence uh, electoral outcomes. Okay. So you should we should be developing regulation that captures all forms of election campaign expending. Yeah. Okay. And I would include in that uh, paid advertising. But I would include in that um, you, a payment of cyber troops, trolls. I would include in that um, uh, use of money to purchase data and data analytics. Uh, I would include in that uh, payment of buzzers, or social media inf uh, buzzers in Indonesia, but pay a social media influencers. And if we want to talk more, more specifically in terms of a drafting legislation, what I would think would be a helpful way to move forward is think, okay, you have a concept of electoral expenditure that is very broad, that captures traditional media, face-to-face -face digital media, you know? and you could have an inclusive list, inclusive list of specific media just to make clear that parties and candidates and other political organizations know what should be disclosed. So you might put in there, okay, we want to specifically know how much you spend on social media, how much you spent on, you know, data analytics and so on and so forth. But I, I, I'm definitely not in favor of med, uh, of regulation that's just targeting particular media, because what would happen is that money will find a different way. That's problem number one. Problem number two, we know this area is evolving so quickly, right? Okay. Um, you think about, it, I mean, the, the, According to the cyber troops report, Facebook is still king in most countries. Yeah. But we know, of course, that's not the case in all countries. Uh, as, as I understand it, for example, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, uh, is WhatsApp. That's actually the primary way of actually, you know, campaigning in terms of social media and so on and so forth. And I'm sure other people can give other different examples. So, but if we start targeting particular forms of media, we'll find that the technology will outstrip our regulatory scope. Thank you for that um, answer. Um, Nini, did the, do you have uh, any other follow-up uh, follow questions? So uh, at this point, uh, we'll have another uh, uh, quick poll uh, question that uh, um, Adi, our friend, uh, has just posted. It's on the right side again. I'll read out the question for you. Digital campaigning has caused unfairness in the elections of my country. The answer choices you have are agree, disagree, and sure. So have fun answering uh, the poll question, and I'll also uh, read out the um, answers to you in uh, a minute. You have um, about 30 seconds left to answer this uh, snap quiz question. And uh, meanwhile, if you have questions also to Professor uh, Tam, please uh, write that in the chat room and uh, address that to all panelists so I can uh, read the uh, question for everyone uh, because uh, of those who uh, of us in, on Facebook can't actually see uh, the yeah. questions yet. Yes? And I think there's a question that um, maybe it didn't go to everybody by going to the host and presenter. So I think it's from uh, Titi Angliani. Uh, do you want me to read that out or you want oh, to Oh yeah, sure. That? Go ahead. I can yeah. see that so you can. Oh, you can. All right. Okay. Right. So the question is, um, can you describe in more detail um, the principle of effective oversight? Uh, who or what institution is better in undertaking that function? Um, I think that's a really important question, uh, Titi. Um, my answer is that 
when you think of the principle of effective oversight, I think in terms of what we need in terms of institutions and regulation, it's got to, it has to be multifaceted. So that's why I briefly mentioned at the end to talk about the ecosystem of compliance and oversight. You actually need a whole range of different bodies working in concert to bring about a culture of compliance, right? So, I mean, of course, the, the electoral management bodies, electoral commissions are important. And, and, you know, in terms of the sharper end of things, anti-corruption agencies, but you also need political parties and society organizations involved. And on the last part, what I would stress is this, is that oversight needs to be occurring externally. That is to say, external to the parties and candidates, but the parties and candidates themselves, as and the other political organizations, need to be able to develop internal systems of oversight. Yeah, to ensure that there's proper compliance with the regulation. Mm -hmm. um, can I just follow up on that? Because uh... You know, those who are uh, those of us in the civil society uh, who, uh, you know, try to monitor uh, and follow money in politics, uh, you know, it's all about transparency of uh, the money that political parties and candidates are spending. But when it comes to digital uh, campaigning, though, uh, it's already, you know, we're talking about transnational companies, you know, big multinational companies and how much money these companies are receiving from uh, political contestants from, um, you know, places like Mongolia. So in yeah. this case, though, like uh, how uh, I mean, not just like Facebook, Twitter, because those are like our uh, usual suspects, but then you know, digital uh, campaigning and all this much broader, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, different tools, right? So uh, how, how what would be your advice to um, uh, civil society uh, groups trying to follow money, and also journal? It applies to also journalists as well. Yeah, I suspect. What I think is a necessary requirement is that there needs to be actually um, a public database of reporting and disclosure. And it's a publicly funded database of uh, a database in terms of disclosure and reporting. Um, because it, it, it really seems to me that, you know, in all countries, and perhaps only US is the exception, but even the US relies upon public data, um, civil society alone cannot produce the data and information to follow the money, right? Okay, it, it can build upon a base of public data and then follow the, and then under, undertake further investigation. So I think that is got to be the key priority. The key priority are proper disclosure laws and a proper public database. And the database meaning, um, so if we, you know, if transnational, like multinational companies are involved within this, it also requires them to disclose certain type of information in terms of the money they are receiving from a national yep. states, right? So yes. uh, who is going to maintain this database? Is it like a national base, uh, national state based database that we're talking about? Or is it something else like uh, some um, international or um, multinational organization? I, I would think that is national, well. National. Uh, the the main source of okay putting putting i mean the the, the problems of foreign interference pose real issues in terms of um campaigning from outside the country coming into the country right okay um but putting aside that issue most of the spending will be by national based actors yes political parties candidates political organizations so that that will be the regulatory entry point yeah okay and it's really about saying okay all right uh how much have you spent on, you know, social media accounts and so on and so forth? Um, where where does where does the, um, the the big tech companies come in is really with the transparency in terms of the political advertising. So basically, giving telling people, okay, this is a political ad, okay, or how if there's micro targeting, how did this, you know, why did we end up actually targeting MK? Was that because of particular data? What data did they use to end up targeting you, right? Okay, so for them, they, they're still involved, but in a different way in terms of transparency. I see. Well, it's definitely a double-edged sword. Like, you know, um, it seems like as we um, progress through um, this discussion, the uh, uh, darker side is actually uh, weighing more than the, <laughs> you know, benefits yeah. of uh, digital uh, campaigning. It seems 
But then you said mentioned in your lecture that you know in uh, certain places that you know uh, long term problems like wolf buying um, yep. is decreasing because uh, we now have maybe maybe maybe. I, I, I'm maybe. Not, I'm, maybe yeah so I'm not you know I'm just saying uh, and we just I mean I'd be interested to know other people who think I mean I suppose like I mean Indonesian the upcoming regional uh, elections will be a good a good case study to look at whether um, you know. What I've hypothesized, it might possibly be true, kind of thing. Um, I think let, let me pick up your point about double edged sword. I think you're, you're quite right in pointing it out. I think that's why you know I ended up the lecture by saying, look, we should not avoid, uh, we should not, you know, see this as a binary issue. I think it's a much more complex situation. Is that also, I've, I've called for regulation, but we also got to be careful that regulation, of course, can be abused by the parties in government, right? And we've seen this you know, in a related sphere in terms of fake news legislation, right, where it's been used to stifle dissent. And so I think we need to design the regulation carefully. And importantly, I think the implementation should needs to be entrusted in independent organizations like the electoral management bodies. But the, the problem with the, that, though, is like a lot of the AMVs are not sufficiently equipped you know, uh, to deal with this new oh, emerging yeah. challenges. Yeah. So that would be um, something also for us to be uh, concerned ab about, I guess. No, um, no. And we, um, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, so um, they, uh, we are coming um, almost to the end of the event today, and uh, the post lecture poll questions are posted on the right side panel again, uh, for those of you on WebEx. So uh, we would really appreciate if you can uh, fill that out because it's going to give us uh, valuable feedback on um, the lecture today and help us improve uh, as we organize more of these lectures uh, until the end of the year. Um, meanwhile, I would like to uh, thank Professor Jijan Tan for today's uh, brilliant lecture and also your contribution to previous lectures as well, which is, which was very interesting. Actually, I, I had to watch it uh, over and over again. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's very nice. That's a very nice. Very yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Very nice. Especially that. because last week, you know, uh, we had a civil society meeting, uh, trying to figure out, uh, uh, you know, uh, what to advise our government on um, regulations relating to digital campaigning, especially Facebook and Twitter. Yes. Civil society yeah. groups are very active in Mongolia, and uh, we monitored the uh, political advertising um, on Facebook uh, yeah. the, for the first time. So it's a challenge for um, CSOs and challenge for EMBs, uh, challenge for regulators, and it's very unknown exactly. territory. And exactly. as you mentioned in your uh, previous uh, lecture as well, it's not going away. If one, you know, this is only going to grow bigger. Uh, yeah. So uh, I appreciate that we have this multinational platform um, to talk about these things, and hopefully yeah. we'll see a more clarity. Um, and, no. and, and if you, if you have final remarks to make, I'd like to now invite you to do that. Yeah. No. Thanks for your kind, very kind comments. I think the I think the the point I would stress is the right one. This is a transnational, international problem, and I think. Uh, Perhaps what we can think about in terms of this, uh, the constituency for this lecture series that I think, you know, the, the sharing of information about, you know, best practices and worst practices actually will be, I think, quite a useful thing in terms of all our the different countries are trying to grapple with what seems to be a common problem. Um, thank you, um, Professor Tham. And also, I would like to thank International Idea uh, for uh, making this possible, making today's event possible. And um, also uh, our friends from Asia and the Pacific joining us uh, today from your um, different countries and from uh, some of the places, actually, I think it's quite uh, uh, late now. So especially to those of you who are joining very late, uh, thank you very much uh, for making today's uh, event more exciting. And please don't forget to answer the uh, post uh, lecture uh, quiz, which will be up for um, uh, about 10 minutes um, and also after um, uh, you leave the event there will be an evaluation uh, questionnaire as well and if you can fill that out we'll also very much appreciate your contribution so with that um, 
I hope we can uh, close today's session. And uh, Professor, uh, Professor Tao, thank you very much again.